Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Grande skim, extra hot, wet cappuccino with an extra shot. That's right. Grande skim, extra hot, wet cappuccino with an extra shot. That's my complicated Starbucks order. You know, that drink you order and feel a little sheepish while doing so because everyone around must think you are a total coffee diva. The drink you are grateful you can now pre-order on the app so that no one will hear it. Or even worse, that the barista might make a mistake when copying it onto your cup. Everyone has one. And we all appreciate when it's correct, when it's just the way we like it, because we customized it. We picked out the milk, the temperature, the amount of caffeine, the size, every detail was hand chosen by us. Because choice is important. Choice is control. Choice is agency. Choice is a reminder of our freedom. But there are some choices that we are worried about losing. In 1973, the Supreme Court decided, made a decision that gave women the power to choose what was best for their bodies, their lives, their financial security, and their families. And that is once again in jeopardy. It's not the first time in recent history that we've wondered about the staying power of this edict, but this time feels different. It feels more urgent and more dangerous because what we are seeing is a slow chipping away at a great deal of reproductive freedoms. Less coverage of birth control, restrictions on the flow of information from healthcare providers, less access to clinics and women's healthcare facilities, more limits and regulations on when and how a woman can terminate a pregnancy. It seems that slowly but surely, a path is being cleared to overturn Roe v. Wade. And it doesn't seem to be a very long path that will get us from here to there. Let's make sure we're clear about one thing, though. Roe v. Wade isn't about the right to have an abortion. It is about the right to choose, the right to agency, the right to have control over my body and to be able to make my own decisions, not have them made for me. The fight to maintain the ruling of Roe v. Wade is about whether or not you believe that everyone should have the ability, the legal right, to make decisions for themselves. Do you believe that each woman should choose for herself what's best for her body, for her family, for her life. As the notorious RBG put it, the decision of whether or not to bear a child is central to a woman's life, well-being, and dignity. When the government makes that decision for her, she is treated as less than a full adult human responsible for her own choices. In this week's parsha, Matot Masay, we find out that women can make their own vows, but a woman's vow can be vetoed by her father or her husband. Here we see the exact problem that our wise Supreme Court justice has laid out. The rule in our text denies women the ability to be a full adult responsible for her own choices. This text is problematic if we truly believe that women are equal to men. This text is problematic if we do not want to silence women but instead empower their voices. This text is problematic if we believe that choice is the right of every individual. As Reform Jews, we have a great deal to say about the idea of choice. We have built an entire stream of Judaism predicated on the idea of informed choice. In the 1937 American Reform Jewish Platform, the leaders of our movement wrote, 
Each age has the obligation to adapt the teachings of the Torah to its basic needs in consonance with the genius of Judaism. Choice is not merely something we want. According to them, it is an obligation that each generation of Jews must pursue. In the 1976 platform, Reform Jews continued to declare that choice is essential to our movement, stating, within each area of Jewish observance, Reform Jews are called upon to confront the claims of Jewish tradition, however differently perceived, and to exercise their individual autonomy, choosing and creating on the basis of commitment and knowledge. The ability to learn and to make a decision for yourself is a pillar of Reform Judaism. Without the ability to choose for ourselves, many of us might not even be a part of this community. As the great Jewish philosopher and theologian Eugene Borowitz puts it, the same freedom to give up their Jewishness also makes it possible for Jews to choose consciously to be Jewish. That is, rather than being a biological and cultural accident, being Jewish has become a matter of personal decision about how one wants to live one's life. What began as a fact of birth became an act of existential self-determination. Choice is why some of us have kosher homes and others do not. Choice is why some of us are wearing a kippah tonight and others are not. Choice is how we live the best Jewish life we know how, holding fast to the ability to choose for ourselves. We know that within this freedom to choose, we have great power and even greater responsibility. Because choice, the kind that holds our community together, cannot be frivolous or chaotic. No, we must make our choices with intense care and scrutiny. As Borowitz continued to explain, with a certain humility, modern liberal Jews seek guidance from their religious leaders and traditions, but then insist upon making up their own minds about what they have been taught. We do not frivolously pick just anything. We learn, we think, and then we choose. On this, the Mishnah agrees, stating that lo am ha'aretz chasid, an ignorant person cannot be pious. Learning, thinking, wisdom go hand in hand with choice. We want information so that we feel equipped to make a decision. We trust those who have knowledge about certain areas to give it to us so that we too can be knowledgeable. Just as we seek our Jewish scholars to make decisions about our Jewish lives, so too we seek out doctors and healthcare providers to make medical decisions. We ask them to give us all important and relevant information so that we can make the choice that is appropriate for our personal situation so that we can make a choice that best reflects the quality of life we want to live and the way we want to live it. Thus, rules that prevent the flow of information from doctor to patient also remove choice. And what's worse, these kinds of rules make us ignorant and we may not even know it. The argument for or against reproductive freedom in America typifies what's really happening in our country right now. It's not about Republican or Democrat, conservative or liberal. The fight to keep Roe v. Wade is the fight to decide if we want people to have agency, to have autonomy, to have the ability to choose. Are we comfortable allowing women the right to make a decision about what to do with their bodies? Do we believe that people can and should make their own choices and deal with their own consequences? Do you believe you know what's best for everyone else? Or that each person is capable of thinking and deciding for themselves? Because choice 
is about trust. Autonomy and agency are about respect. As Reformed Jews, we believe that our community will not crumble simply because one person decides to be Shomer Shabbat and another person does not. We know that the strength in our community comes from something much deeper than whether or not you wear a talit. Our ability to choose, to learn together, and have autonomy to do what is best for each of us makes our community more united, not more divided. That each person is an individual who is created in the divine image with real seichel, real wisdom, this is an asset to our community. When more, people, when more people are knowledgeable, when more people have autonomy and agency, when more people can make choices, the greater our community and our world can be. Last week, in Parshat Pinchas, we read about the five daughters of Zelophehad. Malcha, Noah, Chogla, Milka, and Tirza go before Moses and the chieftains to ask that they be allowed to inherit their father's land. He has died and left no sons. And they want the law to be changed so that they can inherit. Moses, uncertain of an answer, consults with God. And God tells Moses, the plea of Zelophehad's daughters is just and instructs Moses to change the law. God intervenes and shows the Israelites that, in fact, daughters are equal to sons, and the law must be changed to reflect their equality. God ruled for women to be equal because choice is not a zero-sum game. The more you can choose, the more choices we all have. The perceived power one gains by taking away another's choice is just that, perceived. When we limit one person, we are limiting everyone. Unfortunately for the daughters of Zelophehad, the story doesn't stop there. In Matot Masay this week, Moses restricts God's ruling in favors of the daughter. The chieftains plead with Moses that they're concerned that if the daughters inherit property and marry outside their tribe, the amount of land owned by a specific tribe will be shifted. So, rather than simply allowing the daughters to inherit the land if there are no sons, Moses decides that the daughters must marry within their Israelite tribe in order to maintain their inheritance. God ruled for women. People in power limited women. God wanted all people, women included, to have the ability to make their own destiny. People decided that this amount of power was too much. Women fought for their right to be equal and won but then had it taken away. It certainly feels like one step forward, two steps back. Yet no matter how frustrating and scary, we cannot stop pushing for agency for all. The daughters of Zelophehad, the biblical ones and the ones who have yet to come, they are relying upon us. They are relying upon us to ensure that choice is an unalienable right for all people, men and women. They are relying upon us to ensure that their choices aren't limited to the kinds of coffee they order at Starbucks. They are relying upon us to ensure that they can choose what is best for their bodies and their lives.